This is my console. Welcome to another edition of Novelist Spotlight. So you've written your novel, you found a, an agent, and you have successfully got a publishing house, or your agent successfully got a publishing house to publish you. And now the full magnum force of Simon & Schuster is behind you. Or so you think. What really ends up happening is they're not spending a lot of money on you. And they're looking at you like, why don't you have an oar in the water on this deal? It's, it's your book after all. So what are you doing to sell books? So traditional publishing isn't what it used to be. A lot of people find that out. Or you get rejected by all the agents and you decide, I have a good novel anyway, and I'm gonna publish it myself. I'm gonna self-publish and I know that I need to market because nobody else is there for me. Problem is I don't know anything about marketing or I do know something about marketing, but man, it's a lot of work. And it's so fast changing that I don't necessarily really know social media channels the way I should, or how to really penetrate them, how to really grab attention. So you're in a little bit of a pickle, but that's why there are agencies out there that specialize in authors and will take your work, take you, build an author brand, get your books sold, and so on. At least that's the promise, and that's what you're paying for. Now, I've got one of those people with us today. My guest is named Andrea Thatcher. She's publicity manager at Smith Publicity. Now, Andrea's going to join us here from Chapel Hill, North Carolina, but Smith Publicity is based in Cherry Hill, New Jersey, and it's dedicated, and Andrea, check me on this, I believe. First of all, Andrea, welcome to the program. Thank you for having me. Now, check me on this. Uh, Smith P Publicity is only, I mean, their sole focus is authors. Is that right? Fiction and nonfiction authors? Yes, absolutely. I think we are, last we checked, <laughs> we're the largest book-exclusive focused um, publicity firm in the country. And you guys have been around for quite a while. You date back to what, the, the company? I think we're coming up on our 25th anniversary. We're very excited for 2022. I don't know what year that sets us back to, but um, we've been doing this for 25 years. The company was founded by Dan Smith, and uh, I think he started it as a one-man shop, and um, he likes to talk about the days of the fax machine <laughs> and faxing every fax machine in the New York Times building. Um, and now we have, I, oh goodness, I should have counted before I started, but, you know, over 20 publicists um, all over the country. And, you know, most of our uh, work is done online. Um, and, you know, we, we don't really send faxes anymore, but we've moved with the times and do all the social media and digital marketing that you would come to expect. So let's talk about social media because that's all the rage these days. I mean, it's swarming with billions of people. That's a good thing, and it's also one of the frustrating things is just trying to get people's attention because everybody's out there shouting or trying to whisper. And maybe that's the key. Maybe we need to whisper, not shout. Um, what social media channel or channels does Smith Publicity find to be the most powerful, and how are they used? It's really going to depend on the genre. I, I'm generally going to be speaking to fiction. We do a lot of business in nonfiction and business books, but I, I'm a fiction specialist, and that's, I know, what your audience is focused on, so we can assume I'm talking about fiction. But even within fiction, you know, if you're doing a YA book or some sci-fi fantasy, you are really going to need to be on TikTok or um, maybe some of the newer things, uh, definitely making video, reels, things like that, whereas as if you are in more traditional women's fiction or literary fiction, there's a great network on Twitter. Um, that's a little bit more for networking than, you know, promoting your book, but there's certainly a dedicated audience you can build there. And, you know, Instagram, I think by far probably has the most devoted book community that also has the most advanced metrics for tracking how these posts and these influencers perform in converting from interest to clicks to sales. Now, what's the coup de grace? I mean, for me, I, I suppose it would be if Oprah and Reese Witherspoon <laughs> both uh, uh, said, wow, this is the book of the month. Um, obviously, you don't make a promise that, that you're going to make Oprah's book club, but uh, what 
what are the, is a really rich vein or what give me a story maybe of of how it can work I mean, I think the, the, you know, we call them pie in the sky or um, A-list. Um, of course, we have authors who want to be on the clubs that you mentioned, which <laughs> incidentally, I should mention, really, that starts at the agency phase. Agents and developmental editors are feeding books to Oprah and Reese Witherspoon. So by the time you get to publicity, that ship has sort of sailed. <laughs> um, but, you know, we, we do put people in Oprah Magazine when that was... Um, um, you know, around and Oprah Daily is the new Oprah property. Um, but, you know, there's a, a lot of content creators out there, um, Bellatrist, um, Pop Sugar, BuzzFeed, obviously, those types of things. Um, Book Riot is another, that's a real big win for our fiction authors, um, especially in the more YA space. Um, NPR remains a gold standard. Uh, so those are some of the outlets that, you know, of course, New York Times. Um, but those are some of the outlets that we consider, you know, the gold standard. All those, you know, bestseller lists, um, Wall Street Journal, LA Times, the bestseller lists are, that's not really the purview of publicity, um, but those are obviously big goals. So I did a podcast with uh, Kale Lawrence. She's an author. She's also a professional. Her daytime job is as, as a professional marketer for a company. And she said that TikTok is the best at uh, generating sales. And she also said, you don't want to do, she, she went out there with a polished video at one point and didn't get a lot of results. And she started to notice that a lot of the videos were much more authentic as in, you don't want to look overly professionalized. And she said when she put other yeah. ones out there that were not so polished, that were more like, hey, it's me and this and that. Uh, she got a lot, a lot uh, more in the way of results from that. So, on both of those counts, what do you think about TikTok, and what do you think about video as a as a vehicle for boosting book sales? Yeah, I think TikTok is obviously we're seeing it be very influential, especially in the romance space and the YA space. Um, more genre fiction, a little less literary fiction, but that's not to say that there's not a place there for literary authors. Um, and I absolutely agree. It is the off the cuff, you know, if you're doing a stylized um, flat lay of your book or, you know, you're doing your makeup and trying to look professional. And that's a, that sounds like an Instagram post to me. Whereas TikTok, you don't have your makeup on. You just read this book. Your tears are streaming down your face. This book rocked your world. That's when you log on to TikTok. That, the people, a lot of people started paying attention when the New York Times had a popular article over the summer about how a book that all these TikTokers were recording themselves crying, reading this book. I believe it was a romance, but I'm not positive. Um, crying, reading this book, and the sales soared. Um, I think it's important to note that those types of stories work are, are, are engineered to benefit those who do have a distribution network behind them of a major publisher. It's a little bit harder to manufacture that sort of success with um, you know, a self-published or an indie published book that may not have, the book isn't available in every Barnes and Noble. The book isn't available at every bookstore you walk into. Um, it can be a little bit harder to manufacture those same sorts of results. Of course, everything's on Amazon. Absolutely. And, you know, people on TikTok are more likely to be shopping on Amazon. I do come from a brick and mortar, um, book sales background. So I tend to think that way a little bit more, but, um, you know, Amazon is the, democratization of book sales so everybody's on there um so of course you can send book fans over to amazon to buy your book but it's it's most beneficial to someone who is already a bit of a household name um or does already have you know that wide distribution network and you know higher ranking in the amazon algorithm um that's not to say that you can't build your brand platform and build your audience um, on that network, but you know, again, in general, I'm always going to be saying it doesn't necessarily lead to sales. We can't draw a straight line from publicity to sales. Um, that's not really what we do. But of course, the work that we do helps boost your profile and gather fans, and then that hopefully leads to sales. Now, you talk about brand building. I see brand building for an author or authoress on your website. 
Well, talk about the importance of brand building and how that's accomplished. Yeah, I think what we're seeing more and more is agents, and this is not a hard and fast rule, but agents and publishers, uh, bookstores, um, lots of different places are asking when when authors approach them or when we approach an outlet about an author, they're asking what's their platform. And so I think agents, some agents, not all agents, but agents, publishers, media are all, they have a number in mind. They want to, you know, book riot or, you know, I'm pulling that out of my hat. I don't have a specific book riot example, but Pop Sugar, BuzzFeed, HuffPost, they, if you're pitching them on a feature for your author, they may ask um, how many followers do they have or they go look, they see, well, this person only has, you know, 500 followers, they're not going to be able to share this piece with that many people, and therefore they're not sending clicks back to our website, whereas the benefit to them, if you have 100,000 followers, they want to feature you because you're going to share their feature, and then your audience is going to click on their website, and they can tell their advertisers that they got how many clicks. Um, so there's a lot of, you know, kind of crass number crunching that is behind some of the idea of brand building. That's sort of the commercial side of brand, brand building, but I think you know especially for fiction it's much more about developing a relationship with your audience um authors can be introverted or solitary or not so into putting photos of themselves online but i I really believe that the authors that we see most successful on tiktok or instagram or whatever they're sharing their lives they're sharing themselves it can you know people are like why do we even care about what i say and that's you know, just not the attitude that you can have going into this because we want to, you know, it can be your breakfast. It can be what you're reading. Um, you know, if you want to keep it more book focused, it can, you know, shelfy is what's on your shelf. Um, there's a lot of ways to connect with your audience. And then when it does come around to promoting your book, we always, we talk about the 80, 20 rule. You want to have 80% interesting content and 20% promotion so that people are engaged with your content. They enjoy you as a content creator, as a writer. And then when it comes time to, you know, sell them your book, they're more interested in, in clicking and, you know, supporting you in that way. What is your genre when you curl up on a rainy day in Chapel Hill with a hot cup of cocoa? Uh, Andrea Thatcher is reading. Uh, what genre, or is there a particular author who floats your boat? I like a lot of historical fiction. I like a lot of. I again, coming from a book selling background and just in the industry, I feel sort of a pressure to be reading the new hot books. So you know, I'm still trying to read the Sally Rooney that came over came out over the summer. That's not to say that I don't like it. I'm just not always in the mood for an emotional breakdown. But um, you know, I like a lot of fantasy. I love Lee Bardugo is one who I send people, especially fantasy or YA. She has a great Instagram um, presence. Um, and I'm trying to remember the name of the writer for the one that recently became a Netflix, Jenny Han, Netflix movie, how I, all, to all the boys, to all the boys. Um, she has a great um, Instagram. I, I think they have great social media followings. Um, and they, you know, I think I send people to their accounts to see what type of content they can be putting out there and creating to, you know, bring their audience in. But yeah, I read a lot of YA. I I read pretty widely, I think. Okay, let's uh, let's deal with a stereotype here. The people who are authors oftentimes are people who like sitting alone in a room and don't particularly like other people. They're kind of droll when you get face to face with them, but you want them to have an oar in the water, as I had said earlier. And um, obviously they're hiring you to do a lot of work, but an author with a personality, it sounds like, who can actually create that relationship with the audience um, that you're talking about for helping build their brand and build a, uh, an abiding relationship with the people who are reading you know, his or her books. What, uh, what's been your experience as far as that goes? Um, you know, what are you looking for from the author himself or herself? It can it can vary so much. Sometimes authors, uh, you know, every week are like, what, what should I be doing? What should I be doing? And I'm like, well, you know, creating content, um, you know, following people, the media that we're trying to go after to, you know, maybe have an, uh, a relationship with that media outlet or that journalist. 
Um, and then there's people who really just are not interested. It, it's my job. They're not really self-promotional. I, I do think there's a lot we can do for you. We can't do everything. I do think that the author, no one wants to hear it, or I mean, maybe some people, but a lot of authors do not want to hear it, but you do have to get comfortable with a certain amount of self-promotion. Um, and I mean, I think it's a little bit like, it's the same as trying to get comfortable asking your friend to buy your kids candy come fundraiser season. Or if your friend said, hey, I'm playing, I'm singing at church or I'm playing in a concert or something, you'd want to support that. You wouldn't find that strange of them to be telling you or posting on their social media. And, you know, this is your thing that you want to share. And I don't think you need to feel odd about that again we don't want to see all of your content be buy my book buy my book buy my book but your friends want to support you your community is following you because they're interested and i think you can kind of maybe either fake it till you make it or just trust and have that confidence that you know they're gonna if you're posting about your book a lot the month it comes out they're gonna understand and then you know there's gonna be times of the year when you're supporting them and supporting other authors and helping out with events and things so i think it all comes around but you do have to become a little bit comfortable with self-promotion and just get used to the fact that that is part of the author's job now so how important are speaking engagements you see that a lot more on the nonfiction side, I, I would say, um, partially because nonfiction or business authors are speaking at conferences where the ticket was $500 and they throw your book in as part of the ticket and then you get royalties from that. Book events for fiction authors are a little bit more difficult. I, I love book events. You know, obviously COVID has changed a lot um i think it's been nice in that i've been able to virtually attend book shows or events that or author signings or book festivals that i normally can't attend there's a great one in savannah there's some in california there's one in nashville i can't travel all those places constantly um so it's nice to be able to quote unquote attend those book festivals and i think those are great places for authors to try and get either on panels or sometimes if you buy a ticket and you're attending the event, you can sort of create your own like sideline event with the hashtags and things around the main event. So if, you know, if it was a Chapel Hill book festival or something and you're an author attending, you could set up a Instagram live with another author who's attending and be using all those hashtags and, you know, taking advantage of that audience, even if you're not on the official program. Um, I, I love bookstore events. I love book signings. I don't think anyone should really expect to be recouping any travel money doing that. Um, your publisher is rarely going to pay for a physical book tour. Again, right now with COVID, that's really not happening. But even before then, um, it's kind of rare. Um, it's the big name authors who are getting sent on those book tours. And so even they are selling maybe... 80 books is a really good night. 100, 150 books is an awesome night. Um, for <laughs> As a bookseller in way, way in the past and as an author, you know, publicist, and I've been in-house marketing at a publisher before, there are going to be nights when you go to a bookstore and maybe you sell three to five copies. And, you know, maybe it's the booksellers calling their friends in to sit in the audience. Um, and that's okay. Everybody's going to have those nights. Um, but I wouldn't expect to generate a ton of book sales. I think the advantage can then be you create, you got a bunch of content that night. You formed a relationship with that bookstore. If nobody came to the book signing, but you talked to the bookseller for half an hour and she starts recommending your book to everybody who comes in, you might sell 20 copies in the next month. And so that's the benefit of that night. Or maybe you've got a ton of pictures and you don't really like creating content, but now you've got pictures to share a few a week for the next month and your content is taken care of. Or a bookstore in a neighboring town or, you know, fans from all over who are checking the same hashtags can find you and discover you even if they didn't make it to that event. So I think if you do want to do book events, it has to be for the love of bookstores and talking about your event and less thinking this is the way to make money. <laughs> 
how important are positive reviews from the critics and and where do they, where are they most powerful i think it can be important um i think you know the trade reviews that are kind of most coveted are still Kirkus, Publishers Weekly, um, Library Journal, those types of places. Forward reviews is one I think all indie authors should be aware of. They only review books from independently published um, authors or small publishers. They don't cut, they don't review any books from the big five because Publishers Weekly, New York Times, Library Journal, they are unfortunately mostly reviewing the same books. You're going to see the same books on all the lists, and that's kind of disheartening sometimes. But Forward um, is very respected in the industry. Librarians, booksellers are reading Forward, and um, you know they, they you have a much better shot as a self-published or small publisher author with Forward reviews. Um, Another thing to keep in mind, and I am, again, speaking, I know you mentioned in the beginning having a deal with a major publisher in your intro. I'm speaking probably at least half to self-published authors because we get a lot of self-published authors. Um, probably about half and half traditionally published and self-published or hybrid published. Um, and so you have to keep in mind if a publisher's weekly review or a library journal review is very important to you. Um, and it, it can be important to you for a variety of reasons. The clout, uh, you know, you just want to see your name in that magazine. Um, you know, you think it's influential with booksellers and librarians, et cetera. Um, you need to be sending them a book four to six months in advance of publication. So there's a lot of authors out there who don't realize that timetable. And so their book is coming out next week and they're excited to send a copy to Publishers Weekly. And, you know, either they don't know or we have to tell them, you know, Publishers Weekly isn't going to re review a book that comes out next week. <laughs> um, that's just not how it works. So if those reviews are important to you, you have to be aware of that timeline. Four months in advance is when the ARCs go out at the latest, advance review copies or advanced reader copies, ARCs. Um, and so ARCs need to go out three, four, six months in advance from the major publishers. I mean, we're getting them. As, I still get some as a bookseller. Um, and I have plenty of books for 2022 already on my nightstand. And I just saw a tweet from, I can't remember who it was now, but it was a major reviewer said they already have over 100 arcs for 2022. So that's what you're up against. These people already have March planned out. Um, they already know what they're reviewing next February. So that's very important to keep in mind if those traditional reviews are very important to you. So what about book conventions and trade shows? Um, if you've got somebody coming to you saying, oh, I go to all of those because you know I, I'm walking around self-promoting my book, uh, and, and I guess we need to think in terms of pre-COVID or post-COVID. Right. <laughs> um, how, uh, yeah, because that's changed over the last couple of years. But um, assuming we get back to reality or, well, back to normal uh, a normal lifestyle, um, do those do those bring any, put any muscle on the bone? It does depend, again, on your genre. Like, um, you know, if you're writing YA fantasy or sci-fi or not just YA, but any real genre fiction, fantasy, sci-fi area, um, Comic-Cons can be super good sales places. Um, you know, I love BookCon, which was a kind of newer consumer-facing weekend as part of Book Expo excuse me, before COVID, Book, Ex Book Expo and BookCon, it's kind of, they canceled, they don't exist right now. I, I hope that they are going to come back post-COVID. Right now, Publishers Weekly does something called The Book Show, kind of in place of Book Expo, but it's just virtual, I believe, again this year. Um, I'd love to see Book Expo come back. I, I'm the nerd who really likes these conventions i get a little teased at the office because everyone's like oh another convention i'm like it's convention time <laughs> but um i love book con especially if you're doing ya you can book a signing and you know you have to expect to be giving away your book for free and these do have to be arcs books that come out in three six nine months um so you know i have an author who writes ya whose book is and we're currently promoting their current book, the second in the series. They have the third book in the series planned for next fall. I was kind of hoping that BookCon would be back up and running this spring because if you had a book coming out in fall of 2022, spring of 2022 at BookCon would be a great time to be 
promoting that book. And again, it is very YA focused at that specific show. Um, it's kind of crazy. Like they open the doors and the kids are running to get their free tote bags and stuff. Um, but you can really find an audience there. Um, if you're writing fantasy or sci-fi, I think comic cons, you can really find an audience. Um, you do need to be very outgoing. You need to be selling yourself. You can't just sit behind a table that costs you a thousand dollars and expect people to walk up to you and look at your book. Um, so you do have to have some kind of draw or, uh, you know, be okay with having the personality to bring people, um, and book fairs and things. I think a lot of them tend to be a little bit more valuable for, um, networking, but I do have people who say, you know, they have local, they have a local fan base and they go to like local craft shows and sell 20 books at each craft show or something. Um, I think, you know, the person I'm thinking of had a very regionally focused book. So I think that was part of the reason she did so well at um, local regional shows. But um, that can also be an advantage. It, it just depends I wouldn't want anyone to be doing any of these things because they think they're definitely going to get an ROI. I mean, especially BookCon. If you're if you don't live in New York, you're traveling to New York, staying in New York for a few days, you're probably not going to make that money back. But it can be part of your brand building. It can legitimize you to have people see that you're a book expo. Um, it can just again give you content to post. It can give you connections. It's a great place to meet agents and editors and publishers and acquisitions editors. Um, so there's a lot of there's a lot of you know benefits to going to these shows beyond the book sales themselves. But I think I I hope we get back to shows. I, I think they can be a great place to you know not feel so alone in the industry. And they're fun, right? They're probably fun. Mm -hmm. I mean, I haven't been to one. I, I've, I been, think I've so. been to one, but it wasn't for my own purposes. I, I attended one just, and it was years ago in San Francisco, and um, it it was, it was fun. <laughs> uh, well, so true or false, Andrea? Um, you're going to sell a lot more books if you're a genre writer than if you are that than if you write literature and you change your subject every book. I'd say, I uh, know, I hate to speak in definites, and that can be frustrating, but um, I'd say it depends a little bit on your genre. If you're a self, and how you're publishing, if you're a self-published author working in genre fiction, you're definitely more likely to sell more copies of a series, you know, if you have kind of the same trope in every romance book, or... Um, you know, a, a continuing series within the same world you've built in a fantasy. Um, but I think that those genres can still be somewhat maligned in the overall, you know, reader, bookseller, literary community. And so I think there's a lot of, you know, book awards and literary magazines and um, more serious, quote unquote, serious readers um that you know those are the ones that are getting the book award the, the you know the booker prize or whatever so there is a certain you know cachet to the literary field that can then lead to bigger sales but i guess it probably is true that you know ya is a big seller sci-fi is a big seller fantasy is a big seller but i don't think we should really ever be working with absolutes well, um, interesting. So romance is always hot, right? YA is hot. Uh, what other categories would you, well, you mentioned sci-fi, um, and you mentioned something else there that it escapes me, but it, fantasy, fantasy. Okay. So, um, uh, are there are some other categories you would say if you're, if, if you're just a good writer and you're trying to pick a genre and you've been, then, then it's a hot one. I mean, I hate, I, I, I fall. Don't write to the genre. Kind of, That's the first thing I would tell somebody. Don't write to a genre. Write what you believe. Right. It, it, write what you feel. That, but there, there are people very out good there advice. Who do that on the side, it seems like. It's kind of like, I mean, John D. McDonald, uh, the late John D. McDonald, there's all the kinds of hosannas for him. But he wrote all those Travis McGee novels that don't 
you know, okay, they're fine. But then he wrote some that were not genre, like A Key to the Suite, which is a fabulous novel. And the level, his, the level of his writing is so much higher there. And it's like, wow, this is what you're capable of. I wish you went off the script more often. But right, you know what? Right. He made a lot of money writing pretty droll detective novels, but he knew how to construct a story and he got a, a following. Um, so, so I don't know. Um, I mean, you take it from there. Sometimes you are kind of writing certain books to pay the bills and then you have your passion project. And I think that's something a lot of people can relate to in, you know, in all kinds of industries, whether it's having a day job or whatever it is. Um, and I, of course, you know, the English major in me, the literature lover in me wants you to write what you feel, but it's sort of a little bit like how you hear like with pop singers or, you know, Taylor Swift and Ed Sheeran and all those people like, oh, they were, they it came from nowhere. They built from nothing, but they were already wealthy and privileged and sort of had a leg up. Um, and there's sort of a similar, you know, privilege at play sometimes, um, you know, coming the self-made story. A lot of those people who, yes, they came from nowhere, but they saw, okay, this genre is getting big okay, we need more diverse books. People are definitely, there's a need in the market for more, you know, LGBT books or own voices books or whatever it is. I'm going to write to that because that's what agents are looking for. I mean, you can go on Twitter and you can look on different agency websites and look for agent wish lists, manuscript wish lists. I think there's even a website, manuscript wish list. I mean, you might be able to speak more to that, but, um, look at what agents are looking for and that's if you want to get an agent that's the way to get an agent and you know i have friends who are writers who are like well i have a middle grade novel but then i heard that there's this new thing that is getting bigger that's like between middle grade and and uh first readers and now i'm going to change my the age of my protagonist like you do have to follow some of those rules if a traditional book publishing contract and a traditional agent traje trajectory is your goal you do have to know your ya protagonist can't be 25 your you know there's just different rules for each genre and i know people don't want to follow the rules they're writing their own story they're ruled by the story but those often are the commercial success stories i have to say um and i will support any authors who you know that if someone that's what they want to do they just want to write their thing and they don't care then yeah absolutely i will help you get reviews and you know but if you said you don't care, then you can't care. <laughs> <laughs> I don't care um, about the results then, right? Right. You know, so, it was, um, Philip Roth said, you know, again, I, a lot a lot of dead authors out there, the late Philip Roth said, I write the way I write. And that's it. I mean, you know, and so he writes, he wrote what he loved. He got outrageous, really. But he was, I mean, um, in enormously successful and uh, you know one of my favorite authors he sh probably should have won the nobel prize and was denied that and uh and so on but the i think if you look at what agents are asking for that's not going to be an original idea so they're going to get flooded if they say left-handed people running financial scams and they're going to get flooded with novels about that and um so i, I you know it doesn't seem that that's uh, a very a, a very good play um, let me ask you about what is happening. I think that's a lot of how a lot of bestsellers are playing it, though. I have to say, I think a lot of the people on the bestseller list are writing to the gaps in the market and writing to what people say they want. And again, maybe they come from a place of privilege or at a connection, um, and it's not truly a self-made story. But I, more often than not, you kind of, you're like, wow, this person just started when they were 35 and they were a teacher or whatever they did. And they just, all of a sudden they wrote this book in their basement and now they have this series. You're often like you find the thing where the other shoe drops and you're like, oh, well, they knew that agent or, oh, they saw that coming and really just happened to write to that thing that was needed at that time. Um, it's rarely the miraculous out of nowhere success story that it's portrayed to be. Mm. 
Yeah, I hear you. So, um, you know, there's physical books now. There's e-books and there's audio books. Audio books are booming, and they even think they may catch and surpass e-books. Um, so, any thoughts on? I mean, if an author came to you and said, "Well, I've got an e-book and I've got a hard, you know, a, a physical book," would you say you really need to get an audio edition of your novel because that's what's what's really hot right now? I think it's hard to think that way. Um, yes, obviously, audiobooks are very high. If you have the option, if someone is offering, a publisher is offering you an audiobook, then yeah, you want to do it. Um, at the same time, I just had an author ask me about this, and I was kind of crowdsourcing from the team. You know, have you had authors develop their own audiobooks? Who did they use, et cetera? And someone came back saying that the budget seems to be 10K. So that's a pretty big investment for, you know, a smaller author and even a bigger author, you know, uh, not all major publisher advances are going to be 10 K and you need to earn out before you get that money. So, um, that's kind of an investment. And I hate to have people put that kind of money into something thinking it's the magic bullet. I want people to put, don't do anything that's not in your budget. I don't want people to stretch their budget because it, it's almost never going to end up, you know, you know what your budget is and really stick to it. If you have 10 K in your budget and you're like, well, I'd have to sacrifice some advertising. I might have to sacrifice some, you know, publicity or whatever it is, but I really think I need to have an audiobook to make this go. Then yeah, sure. Do it. But if you're like, I need to ask my mom for $10,000 or something, then I, I don't think you should do it. Um, but if you have the opportunity and it's not a hardship, um, absolutely, you want to have an audio book. Um, I, I, I don't think physical books are going anywhere. I think they are, and they're very popular with younger readers. I mean, people like to complain about, I don't know what comes after millennials, but the, you know, teens and people being on their smartphones all the time, which is absolutely true, but that kind of makes physical books a novelty. It's almost like, it's kind of how vinyl has surpassed CDs. Um, People are buying an object. They're buying something that represents their identity and their fandom. Um, so they are still buying physical books. Physical book sales are still strong with younger readers. Um, I mean, not not like children's books. They are also still strong because, you know, they might not have a device. But um, with, like, you know, 20-somethings, teens, they're still buying physical books. So that's not going anywhere. But... You know, you also have to have that ebook so that you can put it down to 99 cents and it's not so much skin off your back. You need to have that audiobook because that's a big market right now. Um, so there, there are more and more things that, like I'm saying, you quote unquote need to have. And I know you can't have everything. So you need to find out where your audience is reading. If you know, if you develop your comp titles, the lists of books that are similar to your book and would, and would appeal to the same audience, and you see and you find out that your comp title sold way more on audiobook than it did on hardcover, then you probably need an audiobook. If you find out that it really sold the hotcakes in hardcover and then the paperback flopped, maybe you need to make sure you have a hardcover and not to worry so much about the paperback. I think doing that type of comp title research, and again, a publisher would be helpful with that if you have a publisher, um, is really important to figure out the format. So you mentioned, you know, stick within your budget, don't overspend, don't have mom write you out of the will because you borrowed 10 grand and not pay her back. So what should an author be prepared to spend for a book campaign with Smith Publicity or a similar agency out there. Um, let's say they have resources; they're not going to over. They're they're not going to overspend, but they're not going to know what kind of resources they need without us getting into that. So, what, what should an author be prepared to spend, and what do they get for that? Yeah, um, hiring a publicist is a major financial decision. We never take someone's investment lightly. Um, that's just one of the reasons it's important to explore your options. Industry-wide, individuals can expect to spend 8K to 10K to bring on a publicist with an understanding that that range will increase as the scope of the campaign and the timeline that your publicist is working expands. Um, so a typical, not I don't know if I want to say typical, but our, our general full-service package is three months of full-time publicity. And for that, you... Um, 
are getting, you know, your press materials. It, it's going to be customized to your timeline. So, like I said, we can work with someone whose book comes out next month, or especially if they're nonfiction and an expert in some area, we can work with them if their book came out last year. But again, we're focusing on fiction. If your book comes out in six months, that's even better. Um, so it'll depend on where you are in your publishing process, but it's going to be helping you develop the arcs, helping you develop copy, press materials, um, you know, questionnaires, uh, press releases, pitches. Um, we obviously do the pitching, um, developing the target media list, the list of media that you really want to see yourself in and the ones that we think are most realistic for your book and your genre, um, regional media in your area. If you live in you know, Chicago, we might send to 10 or so places in Chicago. Um, sometimes, depending on the market, there might be some broadcast opportunities in your regional area, obviously podcasts. So developing that target media list with the author, depending on their genre and area. Um, and then getting books out to those people, getting pitches out to those people, developing new angles, um, developing new contact lists every so often, um, depending on when you, you know, if, if it's a YA author, we have a lot of YA contacts already. So I'm usually not building my list from scratch, but if it's a very esoteric speculative fiction author, um, I might need to develop a new list for that. Um, so that type of research and, um, you know, just having our contact resources. I, I think a lot of people are coming to us because of our contacts and just, you know, they don't know who they would send their book to. They want their book on Book Riot. What is their book riot at book riot road dot, you know, 15 book riot road. Like where do I send my book at book riot? Um, and we know who to send your book to depending on your genre. So I think that's a lot of why a lot of people end up coming to us. Um, so it can, you know, it can be support for a book tour, like a physical book tour. It can be blog tours. It can be social media help. Um, we don't do a full service social media service but we certainly help people with content ideas and and you know growing their audience and things like that it, it's very tailored to the author and we develop a tailored customized um, proposal for every author based on their book um, which I don't know that a lot of other firms do um, so those are some of the things that someone can expect when they engage us and what's the price tag on that uh, that starts at that 8 to 10 K range Eight to ten, and if somebody wanted to get really aggressive for this three-month blitz, uh, I, 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 you know, the, the, the sky, of course, is the limit. But if they wanted to amplify, uh, what would you? What are some people spending beyond the eight to ten? I think up to thirty k. I mean, obviously, we can go on forever. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> if you want to keep, if you want us to keep going six months after your book, and we're still getting results, and we still think that makes sense, and there's new markets to tap, or maybe we want to switch and focus on Goodreads, or your come your paperback is coming out. If there's still things to do, and you're still wanting to have us on your team, we're going to stay, and so that's you know a new bill every month. <laughs> so let's say somebody. Pays ten, ten thousand for a three month blitz, and then what after that? What do you tell the author after that in terms of okay, now what should I do? You're done with that. Is it hey, go out there and write your next novel, or is it can you you need to keep you need to keep paddling? You need to keep paddling, and here's the ways that you can paddle. Yeah, I, I do think you need to have. A certain you need to have some sort of idea of what your goals are beyond that point because you know you're so focused on the release date it's it's hard to look past it and then you get there and there is a very real sense of now what um you know if you are an author in a subject area like maybe it, this happens more for nonfiction. you could do speaking engagements you could do those types of things um i think building your audience is what you can always be working on because it's not only going to help your last book it's going to help your next book um i think thinking about if you especially if you have a series but even if you don't thinking about doing discount promos so taking the ebook as i, I mentioned you know uh, 99 cent ebook promo promos are free because Amazon counts a free ebook download as a quote unquote sale. So if you sold five that sold quote unquote sold, 
um, 5,000 copies, even though they were free, the Amazon algorithm is going to be showing you to more people. And so you're going to see a tail to those sales that extends beyond the free period. And that's where you're going up in the algorithm, you're going up in the ranking, they're showing you to more people, they're suggesting your book to more people. Those are the benefits um, that with that strategy you can make your money back there's not a lot of strategies that i say you can make your money back but you will probably make up for the free books that you sold um with doing a ebook promo such as that um but you know we never we're not slam the door in anybody's faces and saying hey you're on your own now sometimes we're developing a publishing timeline and publicity timeline for the next book um sometimes you know we're just gonna you know i, I always tell people I want media contacts to think of me as a trusted source. So if they're like, you know, I'm coming up with a roundup of fantasy that has to do with holidays and your book is about the holidays, but your campaign ended three months ago, but your book is perfect for that person. I want to give that person the perfect book, even if you're not a current client. I'm never going to not share the best book for that contact if just because their campaign ended last week or last month or last year, honestly. So we still are supporting you and we're still there for questions and things like that. Um, but I think developing a list of goals can depend on if you have a next book in mind, if this is a series, um, if you really don't even want to think about writing another book, what should you be doing in the meantime? We can develop plans and goals for each of those scenarios. So during that three-month process where you're promoting, is it fair to say that there's a lot of education involved? In other words, an author will learn a lot about promotion, will be taking uh, you'll, you'll be holding his or her hand along the way as you're developing these materials. And basically, they, they get an intellectual infrastructure in place that they can carry forward, whether or not they hire you again or they decide, I'm going to go ahead and develop these, these plans myself and do what I can as an individual. Is there a lot of education that's conveyed during the process? Absolutely. And we also have consulting um, pre-campaign. If we feel... If we feel an author really needs some help getting to the publication phase. We might say, hey, we think you should do 10 hours of consulting before your campaign to help you, like, you know, I don't know, this cover copy really isn't going to work. Or what, if we think there's a lot of things that we can point to that we could help your website, you need some help. Um, things that we could help you prepare for your campaign. There's a lot of education during that phase. But absolutely during the you know typical publicity phase i i like to think that that's sort of one of my specialties i've worn a lot of hats in the industry and there's many people on our team who are experts in their area that they work in publicity on um and so i like to think that we do bring a level of expertise and i think the feedback that i'm most proud of and get most often is i learned so much i just i know so much more going into my next book I feel so much more confident and like I know the industry, it's not a big mystery. Um, so I, I like to hear when authors say that, um, cause you don't know what you don't know. And I think you need to go into it knowing that, that there's going to be things that you don't know. And, you know, we have to build that trust so that when I say I'm not sending to publishers weekly the week before the book comes out, the author isn't saying, well, why not? I want you to send to Publishers Week. Like, well, okay, if you really want me to, I can, but it is going to be a waste of your postage in your book. Um, because you need to, we need to establish that trust where you know I'm not going to say that if there's not a good reason for it. Um, and, you know, the education and, and showing you the reasoning behind those decisions is where that trust is built. You know, what is a blog tour? I heard you mention that, and I don't know what a blog tour is. Tell me about that. I always describe a blog tour as herding cats, honestly. Um, you know, you want your book, The Week Comes Out, to be blanketed across the Internet. You want a new photo coming into your Instagram every day. Um, you just want that excitement, that buzz. Um, you know, there's... <laughs> arguments over the number but I, you know conventional wisdom i still say someone needs to see your book cover seven times before they're making a purchase decision and so we need to get to those seven impressions and you know that's not always going to be with thoughtful meaningful reviews of course we want those but there's going to be a lot of bloggers or reviewers who say you know i'm booked 
I, I can't, I don't, I don't have time to read another book this month. Well, that might be someone saying, Hey, well, would you like to be part of the blog tour? You don't have to read the book necessarily. Um, you can do a giveaway. You can do an excerpt. You can do a Q and a with the author. Um, so, we do try and find meaningful coverage. There's a lot of blog tour companies out there you can work with that um, for a fee can have 30, I don't know, however many you want to pay for, 100 bloggers write about your book, but it's often the same exact post, the same exact headline. And there is still, there's still a value in that. You know, you're still getting those impressions. You're still getting backlinks that are good for your Google ranking and all that kind of stuff. There's a lot that goes into the strategy behind those and they are still beneficial, but we do focus on more quality coverage, um, a variety of coverage. So by variety, I mean, Instagram posts, TikTok posts, um, you know, Goodreads reviews, blogger reviews, all kinds of different things so that we're not saturating one market and we want to get to all the places, all the audiences. Um, and having that blog tour is an easy way to say, okay, you're going to post on, you know, December 13th. So I'm going to email you on December 10th and make sure, hey, you're still posting on December 13th, right? And you'll say, yeah. Um, so it's really the blog tour to me is a way of having a schedule that we can count on so that we're not just saying these 20 bloggers said they're really interested. We just don't know when that's going to happen or if it's going to happen with a blog tour, you know, when it's going to happen, there's a little bit more of a commitment that it's definitely going to happen. I'm not going to say that nobody flakes out, but so to me, it's an organizational structure, um, but there are a lot of authors who engage these companies that kind of blitz the internet with their book. And, you know, there's a value in that too. So what should uh, people, they, if they spend their 10, 10, 12, 15 grand, three month promotion, realistically, because uh, most people who write know that you don't, the chances of getting rich as an author are extremely, it's like hitting the lottery. Um, but what should they expect in terms of results? Now, we talked about educate. You're going to learn a whole lot about it from people who eat and drink this stuff every day. So we got that. That's a value as well. But you know what they're most interested in is how many books am I going to sell? Yeah, I mean, honestly, a lot of times, by the time sales figures come in, because you have to also think about returnability, a lot of books, you can't cash out your royalty until after 90 days, because that's how long bookstores have to return your book if they don't sell it. So I often don't even get to hear about sales numbers. So I can't speak to that super specifically, but I think we are very results driven. Um, I think something that sets us apart in the industry is our reporting is very thorough, um, very regular reporting, and you're going to see the results. Um, and to me, a result is a media hit. I want to get you as many media hits, as many bloggers and Goodreads reviewers and traditional reviewers, whatever your goal is, getting a, your book in the hands of as many of those people as possible. You know, once I get it in their hands and, you know, if they say this isn't for me or I didn't like it, I can't do anything about that, <laughs> but, you know, getting it in the right people's hands, I can say, okay, well, maybe we need to pivot. If all these, you know, such and such demographic reviewers are saying, nah, this isn't for me, we need to rethink who the demographic is and I can be part of that conversation and we can pivot for sure. But I want to get you media hits. I want to get your hands and your book in the hands of the right people. And those are the results that I'm measuring myself by. So what is a bestseller these days, just in terms of units sold? Uh, how many books need to be sold to make the bestseller list? Because I think it's surprisingly low, isn't it? It really can be. Um, I There's an anecdote I use that is a couple years old now. I believe it was 2018 that I saw this article. But um, for like the previous year, whatever it was, um, the National Book Award winner and New York New York Times bestseller list, number one on the New York Times bestseller list book, sold 5,000 copies. And so that was not only the height of critical literary success with the National Book Award. You don't get to the National Book Award without heavy literary chops. Um, you know, so the height of that artistic success and the height of commercial success, the New York Times book review list, so this person, this book was at the height of both of these things and they sold 5,000 copies. 
we hear the J.K. Rowling stories. We hear the big number stories. It's also going to depend how much your publisher invested in your book. If your publisher invested $200,000 in your advance, yeah, they're going to spend $25,000 advertising your book. And yeah, they're going to send it to every bookstore in the country because they want to make that money back. Um, so that can be part of those decisions. Um, but I think a lot of people are surprised that $5,000 can be a New York Times bestseller. If it's a day that the you know Hillary Clinton thriller came out, if you're in that same week, it's not going to be that. <laughs> it's going to be, you know, I don't know. I don't know how many copies that sold, but I think you need to be more in the twenty to $30,000, 20 to 30,000 copy range in that week um, to compete with that type of title. But um, it, it's going to depend very greatly on, you know, your genre, whether it's fiction, nonfiction, your genre, sometimes there's genre lists. Um, and the week, who the competition is that week, that's the biggest thing. And you can't always, com you can always compete. You can always know what's going to come out. I mean, you can do your research, but something might get dropped in and it just blows your plan out of the water. Um, and that, you know, those types of things happen. And I think we have to, you know, to say everything with a grain of salt because you never know what could happen the week your book is coming out. Say, you know, there's a terrorist attack. Like, there's so many things that can affect um, whether people are paying attention to your book um, that can affect the sales. But I think people are surprised to hear how low a number it can be um, to get on the list. Yeah. Yeah. So we're running out of time, but a couple more questions. One is uh, what I said at the top of the program was, you know, when you go to a traditional publisher, you end up finding it's not what it used to be. They're not going to put a bunch of muscle behind the promotion of your book. Now, OK, I got a big advance, let's say, like you were saying, they're going to want to make that money back. So they're going to they're go out there and spend some cheddar on it. But if you're the average author who gets a deal with, you know, Penguin or Simon and Schuster or Random House, whatever. There, I don't even know if, if all of those names are relevant anymore. There's been so many much merger, many mergers going on. But traditional publishing, uh, the traditional houses, they're not spending a uh, great deal of money promoting your average author, correct? Or, or providing a lot of services to them? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, you know, I'm kind of making this number up out of conjecture, but. From what I've seen, it seems like this is fairly accurate that 90% of a publisher's budget is spent on 5% of their list. They know which books they need to be bestsellers to pay for all those other books that are not going to be. Um, and you, I think, get a sense very early on, probably based on your advance, if you are one of those authors that is going to get the budget that makes a, you know, not an instant bestseller, but makes a bestseller. Now, um, final question. What are the biggest misconceptions authors have about turning their novels into commercial success? I think it is, you know, what that commercial success looks like, like we were just talking about. I think, you know, the average number of books sold for a small publisher is 400 copies for a title and I you know I've worked with publishers where I saw that number for a book I was working on and I was like oh my god I failed what did they do wrong and then I find that that is an average for that company and that is an average for the industry um and so those are you know books with smaller publishers or whatever it may be that has a traditional distribution network. I think not understanding distribution is a big, is a, maybe not a misconception, but something that people don't understand they need to know about. And maybe they don't even understand what I mean when I say distribution. Like, just because your book exists, it, that I guess another misconception is because my book exists, it is going to be in every Barnes & Noble. It is going to be at every indie bookstore. Like, no, if you're with a major publisher, then you'll have a sales team trying to get your book in those places. But if you're not, then if there's no sales team making that happen, you're the sales team. And if nobody is selling and convincing that bookstore to bring in your book, it is not going to be there. Um, so I think those are, those are some things that people are 
kind of surprised to learn sometimes. Mm. Our guest has been Andrea Thatcher. She is publicity manager at Smith Publicity in Cherry Hill, New Jersey. She's joined us on this call from Chapel Hill, North Carolina. Andrea, this has been just a mother load of great information. I <laughs> want to thank you very I'm much shoddy. for taking the time. I like it. I love talking about this stuff. I can tell, and you're extremely knowledgeable. <laughs> so um, really appreciate the time. And, um, well, I'll leave it at that. <laughs>